you, they have heard this phrase, change is the only constant, right? Uh, I'll go further and say, change is not, not just constant, but it's accelerating, especially in these days of technology and that to artificial intelligence. Things are going to come very rapidly to us. In my previous generation, you would start with a job and continue it till the retirement. In my generation, we would change jobs after a few years here and there. Over the career of 20, 25 years, we would have changed five, six jobs. Right? But still, job changing is not really considered good. HR will frown upon it, and especially if you have gaps in the middle. Right? But these things are going to change. AI, technology, and other external factors are going to force upon these changes on your career. So I'm going to talk about the resets, the changes that you may have to do in your professional career because of these technological advancements. Why I'm saying this? Because although these changes are going to come in the future, I leave them in my career itself. So I'll be taking some examples from my own career to explain this point. Let me give you my background. I'm a mechanical engineer and in mechanical engineering, we have a subject called machine design. What's machine design? Design of machines. Uh, basically, you design say automobile, aeroplane, parts and simple things like say table and chair. How do you design a chair? You basically decide its dimension, material, thickness and other things so that if somebody of say 100 kg, 120 kg sits on it, it doesn't break. That's the basic idea. But with the advent of computers, you don't have to manufacture many chairs and then test it them on a prototype. You do it on computer. You do it, do it in software. And that thing is called as CAD, Computer Aided Design. And you test it in, in something called CAE, Computer Aided Engineering. And that was my favorite subject in mechanical engineering. So I did bachelor's here in Pune and then went to US for master's and I did master's in CAD. Yeah. Worked there for a year, came back here for good and then worked again in the CAD domain itself. So I was working in a big multinational company, MNC, which had a parent company in US. Typically that's the setup, right? You would have a European or American parent company and an office here. So things were going fine. I started with a software engineer, senior software engineer, lead, working in CAD domain. But one day, I, I came across an ad where somebody was going to start a startup. Basically. Somebody from US was planning to come here and going to start a company. We have a few peculiar things about that startup. Like typical, you have offices in Europe or America, this company had office in China also. So that was a special thing. Another thing, it had startup nature. No, nobody was there, no employee was there. And then the guy was coming in to start the whole thing. Another big thing was, it was working for a big CAD giant company, number one. So looking at all these things, I decided to take a plunge. So that was my first reset, first reset in the career. So I decided to leave my cushy job and started to join or decided to join the startup. So started with that startup first day, one more person, I was the first employee, one more person joined and we started in somebody else's office. We had two tables at the back, no HR, no IT. Previous day, I had all the facilities. I had people to uh, assemble my computers. They were HR people, but here nothing. We were on our own. We started journey like from scratch, like a reset. We did work well, I think. Eventually, uh, that CAD giant acquired us. So we became the CAD giant. Okay? We worked on projects. We did reasonably good work. And then I went from, say, lead to manager, 
group manager, site leader. So journey was very fine. Professionally things were looking good. I was in a care giant company, possibly the highest position possible in Pune in care domain. But something was missing. And that missing part was on the academic side. So I had bachelor's and master's, but not PhD, the highest possible degree. So I talked with my uh, American manager, said that I want to do PhD. I enrolled, enrolled in College of Engineering Pune for PhD. In PhD, typically you'll have to do coursework initially. And I'll also do uh, what is called as gap analysis or literature search. That I did while being in job. So I'll have all the responsibilities of the group and also do research. My aim was to do very meaningful PhD, not like a, a, any XYZ PhD. So uh, I thought doing both things were not possible. The responsibilities were there and doing meaningful research was not possible. So talked with my manager and I decided that I should take my second plunge. I decided to leave the job and become a student again. So previously I had position, authority, money, everything was fine. Next day I was student, no money, no authority and I was studying with the guys almost half my age. This was the Next reset that happened. So, actually, I, the, the PhD is in, again in care domain. So, decided to publish paper every six months. And that was going fine. So, I was working uh, on a module called de-featuring. Let me explain what that is. Very, very simple example. So, if you are designing a table, and then you want to test it. Both things are happening on software. Right? So, on a table, if you want to do testing, Again, you have to simplify the shape. What do I mean by simplification? If there are small holes, fillets, chamfers, you typically remove them, simplify the shape, take it to CAE for meshing and other things, and there you test it. So this, removing some small things called features, it's called de-featuring. So that's the module I was working on, like a part of research. Writing rules. If the, uh, if the radius is less than 5 millimeters, remove it. Till it is less than 10 millimeters, remove it. So on and so forth. And this research is going on for many, many decades. You need engineering judgment for it. But I came across another one paper which took radically different approach. Altogether a different approach. And that approach was, instead of writing these rules or software logic, that guy gave original shape and de-featured, simplified shapes to some approach. Hundreds of such examples. And that approach, so-called miraculously, found out the logic of de-feature. This was an aha moment for me. Okay? This is miraculous. And this is what is known as machine learning. Supervised machine learning. It's part of AI, artificial intelligence. So I was uh, enamored by the whole thing. So I decided to take my third plunge. So with 20 plus years of experience in CAD, with a PhD in CAD, I decided to leave CAD and start with machine learning. As I finished my PhD, I became a machine learning pressure. At 40 plus age, nobody will give me job with that seniority, with that salary package, not affordable. So I started with uh, working for some small startups just to build my portfolio without money, without taking any money. So I worked there for a couple of projects like that and then um, started getting paid projects also. Eventually got job uh, in that domain. Uh, worked there, became principal architect and all. But then sort of thought that once you are in a company, you are sort of bound by what that company does. So if the domain is something, you only get AI in that domain itself, right? You don't get anything else. So there I decided to take my fourth plunge. So decided that even if I have this very cushy, nice job, 
I should become solo again. So left my job and became an AI advisor. In AI advisor, you have to scout for work. Eventually, I got good projects, different domains, finance and all, and then working in that uh, domain. Um, things are going fine, and I'm now waiting for another reset that will come probably in the future. With this as an uh, with this as a as a role, I would like to explain and suggest few things to new generation. You know, people consider AI is for this common sense guys, mathematics guys. That's not the case. It's for mechanical engineers also. It's for electrical engineers, civil engineers also. Not just engineers. It's for legal guys, medical guys, even guitarists. Everybody should be aware of AI because it's not up to you. It is becoming mandatory, compulsory to know at least something about AI. Uh, I, I would categorize the way you use AI in three roles. So I'm sort of now suggesting two things to the new generation. You have to use AI. That's, that's given. So in which roles? Right? You can either be a user, simple user. How to use it, prompt engineering, everybody is aware of it. How to use it, that, that kind of thing you can do. Second thing is, if you are little programmatic, little developer oriented, you know programming, then you can be a developer. You can build apps in, in AI. And if you are really good at mathematics, then you become a researcher. You invent things in AI. But you have to take one of these three roles, whatever your field may be. And, and the idea is, I would suggest not go for only AI, that's my career, not, that's not the case. AI is actually a tool. You have to have your own domain. If you are a mechanical engineer, be a mechanical engineer. Have, solve your own problems. If you are an artist, have your own problems. But use AI all the time to solve the problems. As the AI advances, newer and newer models come every day, apply them. Do they work for my model, my problem, well and good. So what is happening because of this combo, you become specialized, right? You are already aware of what's going on, so that advantage is there, plus you have not left your domain. So that expertise nobody can steal from you. So having this combo is, is going to work wonderfully. There is something called Gartner hype cycle. Some of you may have heard it. The technology grows. It, everybody starts using it. It's at the peak. How do you decide it's at the peak? Anybody starts talking about it. Right? That's the peak. <laughs> That's what is happening for AI. But what happens? Everybody starts using it. Some things work. Some things don't work. Then the popularity goes down. So it's a cycle like this. It goes down. And then... Wherever it applies, wherever it works, that maturity comes and then it becomes stabilized. So currently, AI hype is going on. So without leaving your domain, you have to try AI-related technologies in your domain. See, it is useful. If it is not useful, forget it. Newer and newer technologies will come in the future. Your domain has to be there with you as your expertise. So my suggestion is, uh, be on the AI wave. The theme of this TEDx is Tarang wave. Uh, be a rider on the wave, Taranga Swar or Taranga Mitra. Be a friend of wave, not opposite because you don't have choice. So looking at the examples from my career, um, I decided that I should title my talk as Hit Refresh. You've heard of this book title, right? Very famous book title, Hit Refresh. You have to refresh your career, at least for the newer generation, externally or by design. I did it by design purposefully, but you may have to do it by external factors. Hit refresh and start from scratch. Um, your career path cannot be like this, like what we had in the previous generation. It cannot be sinusoidal, smooth like this. It cannot be. For me, it was sawtooth wave. <laughs> resets all the time. Just that you have to see, the sawtooth wave is going up. 
right? And it's not going down, right? That's the idea you have to do. Um, take care of it. So whenever in your career, if you see good opportunities for change, the change should not be incremental, plus plus, 10% high, 5% high. That's not the change. You have to have dramatic change, orbital change. You have to go to next orbit. Then only change. That's my suggestion to all of you. So, uh, as I borrowed the title of the talk from a, another um, a very famous book title, I would summarize my talk with another borrowed line from another tagline. So, whenever you see change in your professional career, smell a change, which is of orbit change. Then I would suggest just do it. Just do it. Thank you.